standing in line. Interior, a Food Lion grocery store. Sam, 85, stands in a long line holding a bag of potatoes. He speaks in a Polish accent. His grandson David looks at magazines with synagogue bombings, rebel flags. Sam takes them and puts them back on magazine rack. Buddy, wearing rebel flag shirt carrying case of Budweiser, nears line. I am uncomfortable standing in a line. Buddy steps into line behind Sam. Both lines are stalled. Hey, what's the holdup? There was a time in my life when I didn't know what was happening at the other end of a line. This one doesn't look so bad. I guess. Child in front of Sam begins to whine. I'm tired, Mommy. Standing in line isn't much different wherever you are. You're waiting to get something. Like a food, or have, uh, have a something done, like getting your hair cut. I want to go home. Mrs. Lockett picks him up. Buddy cuts line in front of Sam. Buddy is between Sam and his grandson. Hey, do you mind if I slip in front of you? I only have this one thing. David, come. Sam reaches to David's hand and pulls him closer. But Granddad, we were here first. It's okay. I remember a time when a checkout line meant a much different thing. You never wanted to be at the front of that line. Mommy, I want to go now. Here's the keys. Take them out to the car. Mrs. Lockett exits with child. Good. I hated to see children in a line. I've seen enough of that. I was a child myself, younger than you, when I stood in line. I didn't have the option to leave. If I ever get too tired, I'd be put in that other line, the one that checked you out. Let's go, let's go. What's the holdup? We got places to be, am I right? This one's not going anywhere. But he changes line. Sam does not move up. I avoided that line for three years. Did a lot of things to stay out of it. Things you would never think about. Because it isn't normal thinking. Just basic instinct. David notices gap in the line left by Buddy. Pulls Sam forward. David tries to take potatoes to hold for Sam, but Sam pulls them back. No, no, I've got them. There was a time in my life people might kill for this many potatoes. Time in my life when people did kill for a piece of just one from the bottom of day-old soup. Killing then was so different than now. It became ordinary. All baggers, please report to the front for restocking. Death slept in the bed with me then. I learned to make my way around it, sleeping on the floor. There I could see crumbs or pieces of bread that might have been dropped or laid down for a moment. Mr. Lockett drops change from his wallet as he juggles groceries in arms and readies to pay. Sam sees one penny under magazine rack. Sam places his foot over the penny while the man picks up the rest of the change. David does not see this. It was stealing if you got caught, but you never got caught. Terrible things happened if you got caught. I never stole anything. I survived better than other people. Can I see your ID, please? Action of line stops as young woman searches for driver's license, and beggars place her items in brown bags. I heard that question daily at roll call. Not so polite. My identification was my number. I had no name. It was like these labels, right here. They get scanned. Pat's label on bag of potatoes. Zoom on barcode. Price check on register 8. Lights begin to shift from bright supermarket to banks of floodlights. Great. I'm late. Now I'll never get out of here. Rows of food behind Sam slowly become fences with barbed wire. The loudspeaker announcements become harsher. Register 9 is open with no waiting. Mr. Lockett in front of Sam and Mr. Ely, behind Sam, move to the next line. Would you like in? You don't have very much. You can get in front of me. Uh, thank you. No, I'll stay here. The lights shift now to overhead floods in darkness, illuminating a row of barbed wire fence where the rows of food were, and other shelves become long prison housing. Food Lion has shifted into Auschwitz. You never get in the lines to the left. 
More people crowd into lane nine, which is moving more rapidly. Sam's line is waiting on a price check. Stalled. Register nine is open with no lines and no waiting. More people join line, moving quickly. People are not purchasing items. They're stripping items from their bodies and laying them on the conveyor belt. Glasses, hats, shoes, coats, pants, dresses. They file out the line past the beggars in slips and underwear, as the baker places items in crates or boxes, no longer using bags. Sam does not watch, faces away. You didn't look at them. Most of them were new, and didn't know. But if you looked at them, and they saw how you looked at them, then they would know where they were going. David stops, looks at Sam, and takes off headphones, listening more closely now. Clean up on aisle ten. David startles at the harshness of the intercom voice. Some of them knew. You still didn't look. I need a bagger on nine, please. Bagger three joins and begins packing away the items being left by people in line nine. This checkout clerk is fast. They were efficient. They processed us, like at that counter. You see how they pack as many things as they can into one bag. It was like that. After the gas chambers, they fit as many as they could into each oven to get an efficient burn. Not enough bodies wastes time. Too many bodies prolongs the process. It was a skill that was taught at the camp. A skill we were forced to practice so the soldiers wouldn't have to. Sam's line moves ahead one more person. David looks at other line, confused. My mother and my sisters were not part of that system. The crematoriums were not yet built. The gas chambers were, but not the crematoriums. And you could smell what they are burning in the ditches. What are they burning in the ditches, Grandad? On my first day there, I asked, Where are my mother and sisters? Where? A Jewish physician standing next to me, by the real showers. He told me. There was no diplomacy. He explained what that smell was. Coming from behind the building, I'd watched my mother and sister enter. Several more people from the line to the left are escorted away, naked. It was a distinct odor, like nothing else. You knew what it was, just like when you walk in here and go past the bakery, and you know whether they are making cinnamon rolls or Italian bread. That distinct. Sam smells the air. Today. I think it is actually white cake. Another skill I picked up. How to smell down the food and what kind you can get where. Good for bartering. Food was currency. And jewelry you might find or buttons. Sam reaches down and collects the penny he is standing on. Sam looks up at a 1940s outdoor intercom on a post. Manager's assistance on register 9, please. Food was the best currency. It was what everyone needed currency for, and nobody could afford it. Sam's line moves ahead, as does the other line. Sam hides the sack of potatoes behind his back as he moves forward. David continues to watch the other line and does not move. And you never let anyone know you had any, or you didn't sleep because you'd spend the night guarding your food. You could afford to lose sleep more than you could afford to lose food. Sometimes you would share with certain people. Sam touches David to get his attention. He gives David the penny. The line on the left diminishes with the last person, undressed and limping, who is escorted away. All of the clothes and jewelry are crated by beggars. Beggar one picks up several gold rings and watches, admiring them, before adding to the crate. Mostly, you bartered. Sharing was too costly. Manager and cashier at Register 9 take all of the crates at the counter and exit. Nothing you had to offer got you out of the lines. Lines for inspection. Lines for food. Lines for roll call. Lines for haircuts. Lines for delousing. That was the worst. But not so much the chemicals. And delousing meant you had to stand naked. He is hiding his potatoes the best way he can. David watches the last naked limping man as he exits the dark doorway with two beggars and is astonished at the transformation of the food lion. If you did have food, 
he would need to hide it somewhere other than your clothes. You do that, and there is no guarantee you will still have it when you got back. I had good hiding places. Mostly I keep people from knowing what I have so they don't think there is anything they can get from me. It makes hiding things easier. Sam gets to the front of the line, holding the bag of potatoes behind his back. Do you have your food line card? Sam pushes up his sleeve, thrusts his arm with his tattoo out in front of the cashier, as if she were the SS officer. Cashier one looks at Sam's tattoo, confused. Sir, your food line card? Sam is shaken by the question, and notices the lights are back to normal with rows of food in aisles again, except for the doorway used by the beggars and people exiting line nine. David continues looking to the dark doorway, just exited by the naked, limping man. Should I use your number, or do you have a card? Sam pulls his arm in, rubs the tattoo, pulls the sleeve down, and takes his card out of his wallet. He places the potatoes on the counter. Cashier one scans the barcode. Two dollars and seventy-eight cents, sir. Sam silently pays her and continues to stand in place. He opens the bag of potatoes and begins to hand them out from the bag, first to cashier one, then to the people behind him, and then to different people in the store who take them, confused but kindly, as he explains. I am alive today and in Newport News, Virginia, and that was Auschwitz 70 years ago, and I can afford to give away potatoes. David follows behind Sam, who is still giving out potatoes. Grandfather, should you really be doing this? You just bought them. I can buy another bag. I can buy potatoes 24 hours a day. Sam gives David a potato. Have a potato. I can get a whole other bag if I want. Sam holds potato up to camera. Here, eat this and enjoy. Fade out. <laughs> 